What's up, everybody? Welcome to Tom Curran's Patriots Talk podcast. Alongside is Megan Ottolini. Hi. What's up, Tom? Okay, relax. Uh, Meg, of course, from WEEI, longtime friend of the show, former Quick Slants co-host. We're going to get into plenty of Patriots talk from what's going on down there this week and the general mood of the team. But first, I want to rewind a bit, Mego, to that quote from Gerard Mayo from earlier in the week on the Patriots roster and being in the midst of a, well, a rebuild. If you look at free agency or through the draft, we're always trying to improve our roster. Now, in saying that, we had you know, a lot of holes on the roster that we felt coming out of the draft that we addressed. Now, in free agency, we still felt like we signed the best offensive lineman in Mike Onwenu, um, and then re-signing some of our own players, which was definitely part of it. Now, once again, look, if this isn't a one-year thing in my mind. Um, it's going to take time to continue to build out the roster. So in light of that, I decided on Wednesday, Mego, to ask Gerard Mayo, how do you make sure that your team maintains a sense of urgency when you're broadcasting that it's a rebuilding year, which we already knew that it was, but how do you maintain that urgency? Here's his answer to that. Additionally, I'm going to chase it with his answer to why the team or was the team in on Devontae Adams or Amari Cooper, which is kind of a telling response. That's the tough balance. And I would say, you know, from my perspective, we can win with the guys in that locker room and we just have to go out there and do it. And it starts this week against Jacksonville. You know, those are conversations that we, you know, when I say we, the scouting department, Elliot and his staff and the coaches talk about, I would say those, those teams that you're mentioning are at different points in their, in that cycle, you know? So uh, we were, we weren't really in on that. So. All right, buddy. Thank you for coming in. Thanks for having me. Listen, we're both down there on Wednesday and we're hearing Gerard Mayo say this and it does hit you as you, as, he's discussing especially the wide receivers yeah we can't buy those things right now it was so telling to me tom because what we're used to hearing is well we call on everybody we kick the tires on everybody and just the admission of whether you think it's because you know those guys don't want to come here or you know you don't want to give up the draft capital because of where you are in your rebuild or you just look at the division and you say there's a clear split of the bills and the Jets up at the top, and not in that particular order, and you and the Dolphins down at the bottom, and you're in way different tiers. I just, it it took me a little bit by surprise, the transparency of it. Yeah, and he does want to be radically transparent, but you're also, again, six games into the season, and I I hate when people distill things and overstate them, but you are, in essence, saying, we're not good enough, we're not going to compete in that vein as a in that roster building vein because that's not us right now we can't be adding players to try and win now and give up draft capital and take on a bunch of money in some of the same way and I agree with it I didn't think you needed Calvin Ridley I didn't think you needed Brandon Ayuk what do you need a 30 million dollar receiver for right now you can't even block long enough to get somebody open. Wait until things are settled, but to hear them articulate it. Well, and I think it goes back to what you started with in that first soundbite, which is the sense of urgency this season. Not only are you trying to get better this season, but are you trying to help develop the quarterback who's now going to be playing double-digit games through the rest of the season and give him somebody who might be an easy out? You know, you look at Calvin Ridley. It's not like he's been a, a world buster this season, mm-hmm. so it's nothing's a guarantee. But I do think it feels a little bit like you're not punting on the season, but you're saying that's not what it's about. It's not about bringing in the super high-end right. talent, even for our young starting quarterback now. Here's what's funny is there's all kinds of different one-in-fives, and we talked about mm-hmm. it. This one-in-five, and I can't remember if the Patriots were one-in-five last year um, with Mac. I don't think that they were, but that kind of fruitlessness and negativity is different from this, isn't it? Absolutely. And it's just too, honestly, I think it's just accepting who you are and you have to decide if that acceptance is good for the Mm -hmm. locker room because you're looking yourself in the mirror and saying, hey, we're a young team. We need to embrace this rebuild and the season is about developing ourselves. Or if it's an acceptance that goes, it's not about being competitive on Sundays, because that I think is, is very different from the way that Bill Belichick approached week to week, even if you end the season with the the record not being so right. incredibly different. The vibe around this team last year, regardless of what the record was, at the same juncture was, it's a team that had high expectations with Bill O'Brien coming back and a first-round quarterback in his third year and Bill Belichick on the sidelines. 
So when you get to one and four or one and five, you're still not accepting, well, this is where we expect it to be. So there's a level of urgency. And then there becomes a level of anticipation, especially, and I'm just contrasting to last year. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the fallout going to be from this level of disappointment? It's, it's much more fascinating. This is more like we're taking our medicine. We know we're going to take our medicine. Can you, you don't want them to whistle while they work. Right. With this and become, and I, I talked about this with May a few weeks ago, and I, I don't think that they're accepting losing, but I think it creeps into your level of expectation. I think so too, because it makes you look at it and go, ultimately, what is this season about? Is it, is it not about winning week to week? Is it really just about finding the bright spots and coming in on Monday and feeling like you're building the foundation that has not been there through the draft for several years at this point? You know better than anybody, Tom. And I think that that is just, it's more like a big existential question for the it team. It is. And that's really hard for individual guys in the locker room to deal with, to look at it and go, I'm supposed to accept that the franchise is in a position Think of somebody like Antonio Gibson, just came from the Commanders, who went through a similar thing for almost 20 years, pretty much, and now he's with the Patriots, who are looking at, at each other and going, we want to play well for our new coach, and we've got this great young starting quarterback, I think, but it's been really crazy around here the last five years, and so we need to fix some things this year. That's hard for guys individually. It is hard, and it is also hard when you understand that this transition it's already gone through a transition. There was a bill rebuild that began in 2021. There was a bottoming out in 2020, and Bill's rebuild didn't take. It was the post-Tom rebuild. Correct. And now we're in the post-Tom Bill rebuild. Yes. And when you look back at the history of the Patriots, I've compared this team so many times to the 1993 Patriots. First-round draft pick, new head coach, a new owner to a large extent with, with Robert Kraft. So you had this little troika there, but it was a Hall of Fame head coach, and it was a team that had already gone through – 1989, 90, and 91, and 92, when they were, had solidified themselves as the worst team in the league. So when Bill Parcells came in with Drew Bledsoe, they had already been a laughing stock. So the expectations that Parcells was able to inject because of who he was and the fact that he was the most sought after, he was the, the lion in the jungle that everyone wanted to bag, they bagged him. And this team sucked. They were 1-11. <laughs> through 12 games, but they won their last four games. And then the next season they went 10 and six. 10 and six, my math's still good on that? Sounds right, yeah. 16 games. Yeah, it was a 16 game season then. 10 and six, uh, wild card team, Curtis Martin, they lose to Bill Belichick and the Cleveland Browns in the first round of the playoffs. But that tweak to a bad team that was just starting out, they never accepted in 1993 that we suck. They, that's the thing, they never accepted it. And that's why I think they're in a tenuous spot here. That's what I think was really interesting in getting to talk to some of the guys today. And even just at the podium, Dietrich Wise being up there, I asked him about Devon Godchow's comments after the game. Because it's the second week in a row when Devon Godchow has expressed a lot of frustration with performance from other guys on the field. Saying at times that guys are being selfish. He said that on WEEI. And then he also said it, after that game that he felt like there was a level of quit, to paraphrase. And Devon to me, Gladshaw going to immediate Trump cards, <laughs> like, quitting, selfish. Yeah, I mean, you better be pretty well versed on whether or not that's actually and happening. And that's why I asked Dietrich, because he's a captain on the defense. And I do wonder, like, you don't want to hear those terms early in the season, even if it's because a guy's pissed off and he wants to win. You want that, but you also don't want other guys saying, wait, he said, he said we quit out there? People quit out there? Like, I don't, I'm not getting that. I mean, that's the kind of thing. That's that, dysfunction. That is dysfunction. And you better be sure of it. And you better have already spoken to those individuals prior to making that a public proclamation, in my estimation. And Devon Godshaw doesn't need advice to me on how to deal in a locker room. He's been in the league a lot longer than I was. But I do, think as a co <laughs> I do think <laughs> as, as a co-worker, you better be really sure if you're going to lob people under the bus that, they're actually doing what you're accusing them of. Well, that's the kind of thing that can create a level of dysfunction. And I also think there's other little signals, for lack of a better word. Indicators. Indicators. One of them is penalties. And we asked Gerard Mayo on Wednesday, or I did, because that just bugs me, the penalties. You can't keep walking up there after the game and saying, yeah, can't have it. Well, then what? And this is brought to you by Shaw's.
perfecting the art of fresh. I'd like to see the Patriots start to perfect their penalty situations. Gerard? The common denominator is just a lack of focus. You know, when we, you know, we, we've, we're in the middle of the season now and to have a penalty on the first play of the game is just unacceptable. And so it's a lack of focus. I will say this, like, there will be changes uh, for this game. And so my message to the coaches and the players, really, we want our most dependable players out there uh, that we can really count on. If you're going to, you know, pre-snap, post-snap penalties, we can't live that way. So I guess the, to answer your question, it's the personnel part of it, like a wake-up call. So penalties, some are sins of commission. You got some numbers there, I know. Some are sins of commission. You're trying to make a play out there and you run in th through somebody. Marcus Jones, PI last week, kind mm -hmm. of. Some are crappy calls, Marte Mapu. Some are just stupidity. Hunter Henry going off sides, a captain during a two-minute drill the prior week. Um, to me, you look at these different kinds of penalties, there's a lot of preventable ones. Yeah, absolutely, and I think like what I wanted to highlight here was you would think, looking at the situation with the Patriots, you go, well, you're throwing somebody like Demontre Jacobs out there. You're, you're churning through players yep. in your depth, and so you're trying to get them up to speed on game day. But as you said, a penalty like that one by Hunter Henry, a captain, and who's been with this team several years, inexcusable. You look at the 12 in the Dolphins game, Eight of them were by bona fide starters, and not starters in the way of Demontre Jacobs starting the game, but starters like Ramondre Stevenson, like Hunter Henry, like Jalen Polk, rookie, but getting a lot well, of Keon playing White. time this year. Keon White in both games, in both the Dolphins and Texans. And I've talked to guys in the locker room after these games, and they're just as frustrated as anybody else. And a little bit of his... I've never seen anything like this before. I can't believe how they're calling this game. Right. But at the same time, you look at it and you go, well, some of these penalties, you can just see it clear as day. They're not all the call that was on Leverett in that game two, right. two weeks ago. And that's, that's the thing, too, is, is Bill Belichick always said, and we are going to invoke Bill until the day we retire <laughs> or die, whichever comes first. And the reason for it is the man's a genius and he had many mantras, but one of his great ones was, do business as business is being done. So mm -hmm. if you see an officiating crew coming in that is flag happy on hold, you better not hold. And the group and the crew last week was a very flag happy crew. We'll see what happens when they go out to England, out to England, when they go to London this yeah. week. We're going out to England. Um, they're heading to London. And this actually underscores another aspect, Mego, of the Patriots and being able to focus. Was it about the plane time? Because there was like a lot about a lot how of do plane you relax talk. on the plane? How, do you relax how much sleep do you get? Can I play boggle or will I get too wound up? <laughs> um, but these, these are games that challenge you on how much you prioritize winning and how much you're able to prioritize the things you have to do. I look at penalties. I look at dysfunction like Chooks of Korofor leaving the team. Mm -hmm. um, disarray in the locker room or on social media with Jalen Rager or Christian Barmore with a, an allegation this week about um, the police in Providence, Rhode Island, or Javon Baker complaining about his situation, or Jabril Peppers last week. All of these little things are signs of what's going on in the workplace, how serious are these employees about just going to work, going home, getting a night's sleep, going back to work. Yeah, and I think it's it's not just the departure from Bill Belichick where it was basically a clampdown for the most part on if this stuff happens, nobody ever addresses it. And, you know, you just don't hear complaints mm -hmm. for the most part until after the season's over. I don't think it's just that. I think it's an indicator of how young the team is. Right. I mean, look. And Tom, how young the staff is, too. Yes, yeah. It's a lot of people learning on the job. I'm also, I don't know, this might be more of an indicator of my age than anything, but I'm looking down the roster day to day and I'm going, there's a lot of guys on this who were born between 99 and 2001, 2000. Like that is, that is a young, young team compared to some of the groups you've had coming through here before. And you always want your coaching staff to be able to relate to the players. And that was a major aspect of Gerard Mayo's pal palatability for ownership. He's going to relate better to the players. And that's, that's good. That's great. I'm not at my age. I got kids that age and younger. Excuse me. I have kids that age and older. So I'm well old enough to be their dads. They're all going to operate in the workplace and in their day to day in a different way than I did growing up with a phone that was attached to a wire. Right. There were 10 years ago, if a, somebody got pulled over, they probably weren't going on their phone, you know, to right. use the Baker 
But as I always knew, if, so, if I did something wrong, the last thing I want to do is call attention to it. Well, like, maybe you're trying to get people on your side, you know? You're saying, I, I, just, I mean, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. It just doesn't <laughs> work. But we see things like this happen, and we understand the Patriots are going for a game that is highly marketed by the NFL. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of constraints and requirements on their time. How well are they able to maintain Maintain focus against the Jacksonville Jaguars, which will be the second start for Drake May. And I don't know how many starts it's been for Trevor Lawrence, but he's getting after it, and he is the quarterback of a 1-5 team. Mego, let me just go through this. This is the quarterback crop from the last couple of years. First rounders, Trevor Lawrence, Trey Lance, Zach Wilson, <laughs> Russell Matt Wilson. Jones, Justin Fields. That's all from 2021. We had Kenny Pickett in 2022, and then last year, Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud. We're looking at the top three picks right now. We're going to see one of them on the field this week. But all top three picks this year between Jaden Daniels, Drake May, and Caleb Williams, people are like, these guys are great. No problems here. It flips, doesn't it? It does. And we were talking about this before the show, but that was such a small sample size that we've gotten so far with this year's draft class of rookies. So it's great to look at it and say, wow, is this going to be the greatest rookie class since who knows when? And what a time for the Patriots to use their number three overall pick on a quarterback because you got it from this class. It's way too small of a sample size to run away with that. But for me personally, as a fan, as a football fan, not just as a Commanders fan and a Patriots writer, but a football fan, it's much more positive to be able to see these quarterbacks contribute in their rookie season than what we saw with the Bryce Young, with the Zach Wilson, mm -hmm. even with the Trevor Lawrence, where Trevor Lawrence is somebody who was so highly touted coming out of the draft. And it, the talk was, well, the situation's just so bad. And you can't ruin a Trevor Lawrence. Look what he did. He was stuck with Urban Meyer that freshman year and then, or that rookie season. Mm -hmm. And then he goes in and he's able to get to the playoffs and he's all right. It's, it becomes with these quarterback classes, you can twist yourself into a pretzel uh, to justify whether you want to expend that much draft capital or not. And so I think this class is a dangerous one for yeah. teams in the future to look at and say, if it's the right time, you can go one through four and be great. Depending on their situation. You know, when you look at the Chicago Bears, why are they good? Well, they got the Carolina Panthers draft pick. They weren't as bad. They weren't a disaster when they got Caleb Williams. And Caleb Williams is pretty friggin' good. Like, Andrew Luck level good, perhaps. I'd like him as a comp for him. <laughs> anyway, you get a player like that and put him on a team that's not a disaster as the number one overall pick. You might have better returns. All of those players that we'd mentioned here or that we're going to look at, you know, with C.J. Stroud and Bryce Young, Bryce, excuse me, C.J. Stroud being the, the exception, were in bad situations. Which is why, even though I think Drake May is electric, even though I think Drake May's ability... I'm so glad you're over on this side of the street now. Well, I think he's... No, I, I never... You, you always liked him. I never thought he you stunk. Oh, no, no, like no, the they, no. They And they still shouldn't have drafted him. Yeah. Legitimately. I don't care what he does this year. They didn't need a quarterback. They needed players everywhere because what's going to happen is Drake May is going to be back in quite a similar situation next year after the team goes 3-14 and 14 or 5-12. and 12. With Travis Hunter. And Travis Hunter. And I don't know if I want anybody coming out of Colorado's program at this <laughs> juncture coming to your Foxborough and not what really being psyched about it. accent work? I'm just, it's, it's just, uh, I'm just saying. You're building a team right now that needs to have stability. And you've put a quarterback into that situation and have already announced, we're not very good. We're not going to be very good for a while. Just keep looking at him. We're going to get better. My idea was, don't look at us for a while. We're going to stay behind this curtain and keep getting better. Okay, we got the offensive linemen. We got the wide receiver in the first round, not the second round wide receiver that we had to project in Jalen Polk. And then you drop the quarterback in, and people go, oh, who's the quarterback then? Isn't that Drake May wasn't the last good quarterback that's ever going to come out of college. It's kind of like the difference between starting the new year and saying, I'm going to get into shape, and I'm going to put myself on a six-month nutrition plan, and then I'm going to merge in summer and look great, and I'm going to go on a crash diet. Right. <laughs> it kind of feels like the Patriots are on a crash diet. They went big. They went for the, for the quarterback. But is anything sustainable around it? It's yeah, just, they're still not beach it's ready. Extreme. Yeah. They're not beach ready at all. Unfortunately. And because of the extreme And we factor, all have to look at it. We all have to look <laughs> at it, and there's rolls and skin everywhere. <laughs> but I think if we look at the Patriots and use that example of 
you know, a team having the option, all those situations were bad. There is absolutely without reservation, no question in my mind that the Patriots situation right now ranks with many of the others, whether it be Carolina, although ownership is better than David Tepper, whether it be the Jets. Eh, I don't know if they were the Jets. Are you talking about Jets with Zach Wilson? Jets with Zach Wilson and Adam Gase. I would say that that's kind of comparable. Yeah. I mean, it's the first – look. The difference is do you have Zach Wilson or do you have somebody who is closer – not saying he is, but closer to like a Joe Burrow-type team changer? Because some of that is also the personality, which I think people are treading lightly around because – of what Mac Jones, the situation he was put in uh, at the end of his career here, and people making the direct comparisons between those two quarterbacks. But I, I don't know about you. I really like the personality that I see from Drake May on the field. Did you remember particular. that that I had that in my pod plan? Was, that was number uh, five? I did, yeah. I decided to professionally move that along. Did you remember that? I have a photographic memory. No, I didn't remember. Oh, okay. <laughs> because that's the thing about Drake May, the resilience – who he is and how he is, I think, are very interesting. And I talked about this. See if you agree with this. Mac Jones never, I hate the friggin' phrase alpha, but never, he felt as if he had a little bit of imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. We've and we've all been there. And I don't think that Drake May feels that way. He feels as if he was born to this. He looks like he was born to this. And he acts like it. And I think that as a result, he's going to have less, fewer moments in which he's insecure or sensitive enough to, to take it badly. For instance, we watched, and I am not killing Mac Jones. Mm-mm. He had a situation. But we watched him in his first year, and how did he react during training camp when things didn't go well for him? <sighs> Deflated. Oh. It was just. It was he, Charlie Brown. It was the kid in the back seat with his juice box throwing it off the back. This stinks. Oh, you're all right, little buddy. I don't think Drake May is like that. And that's not to criticize Mac. It's just the way he was. And I'd probably be more Mac than Drake May. But like, kind of soft. Yeah, and to be kind a little bit like pop psychology, I do feel Douglas? with with Drake. No, just like pop, not the Demario type. But maybe I'm psycho psychoanalyzing from afar. I do get the sense that Drake, from what I've everybody that I've talked to in that locker room, very professional. Mm-hmm. Not so much a rah rah guy. Goes about his business. I haven't seen a gritty yet. If not, not like, Don't want to see a gritty. Acts like he's been there before, very focused. But in watching him throw that interception in the second drive of the Texans game in his debut, don't you get the sense that he goes, okay, that's not the end of the world. Right. It was and an he goes and makes a tackle. Yeah. And whereas Mac might have tripped the guy. It's not the I'm end sorry. of the world. Yeah. <laughs> he comes back. He comes back and he goes, it's, it's not the end of the world. There's a whole football game to play. Maybe I'll throw another one, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a different way of approaching it. And not, and not saying that it's necessarily 100% better because you can start to be more of a reckless player that way. But I think not catastrophizing the mistakes will go a really long way when you're in the situation that he's in. Which is a very good point. And that's why he is, like Bledsoe was in 1993, perfectly suited, I think, for a really crappy roster. Because he can take it. And I think he's a good teammate. And in growing up as he did with a father who played the position, you grow up and you have that kind of tutelage in your own house. You have brothers who played high-level sports and have played on good teams and bad teams and probably been great players on teams where the other kids weren't that great, whether it's baseball or soccer or AAU or football. Everybody experiences that. Not that I was one of the bad kids the other kids would complain about, but (laughs) I could see how mad they were. And some of them weren't that mad. Oh, Tommy, you're okay. Um, But to me, I think it helps a lot that he's got that kind of even keel stability. And that's the thing about a quarterback, whether it's Brady or Jimmy or Mac or Cam Newton or Drew Bledsoe, for a period of time, they become the region's surrogate. Mm. <laughs> they, they, they get pulled closely to the womb, yeah. to the bosom. And I think that that is, we're in the, beginning stages of that with Drake May. And if the kid goes bad, you drop him off. <laughs> so is he enough for, for fans to keep watching on Sundays, though? Because yes. I wrote about this on Sunday. I said it's a reason to be excited. He gives you a reason to jump out of your chair. Yeah, you lost by 20 points. You're the worst team in the league. I felt, uh, 
I, I found that interesting because Michael Felger and I are similar ages and I respect the hell out of the way he does his job and the way he keeps the conversation moving. And as he says, every time I criticize him about something that's too knee-jerk, sorry, we have a show to do here, 2 to 6, it's a daily sports talk show we're going to talk about. It's a grind. So I knew what he was going, I knew he was going to have some kind of take, but his take Monday, instead of saying, wow, this is awesome, I can't watch to w wait to watch Drake May on a week-in, week-out basis, it's like, same team, he didn't do enough, he doesn't do enough to change, the, I don't want to watch the team. I don't want to watch a rebuild. I don't want to watch a team um, struggling to win games. Doesn't excite me enough to watch one player. Paraphrasing, maybe. I don't care. It's the general gist. That's pink hat behavior. <laughs> that is literally. That's a pink derogative hat. phrase. That pink hat. I know it is. Look, if you if you are only aboard when the team's winning and when the development portion of the program comes up, you're like, wake me up when they're good again. Then that is the antithesis, I think, of of what we got into following sports for. You, you follow the sports because you like the game and you like the local team and you don't wait until they're good or not. You just start watching them. And look, if they finish the season with three wins, but one of those wins is over a fully healthy Bills team in December and it's because Drake May puts up something close to 30 points, you also watch for the moments. You know Mac Jones did that last year? Yeah. But I think it would wild? be, again, again, this is where we started, though. It's the different framing of what it means. You can be one in five, and it can mean you're going one direction with your legendary coach walking out the door at the end of the season. Or you can be one in five and saying, it might be rough for a while, but at least there's a quarterback here. Yeah, that was, when, when the Patriots did that, that was a phone call coming in from the governor. <laughs> I'm like, literally on, more on the, on the way to execution. <laughs> Wait, phone's ringing. We might be off the hook here. 29-22. All right, so we've gone far enough with that stuff. I'm going to hit us now. Meg, this is called Total Insight. We've done okay. it once, so I'm not going to act like it's a regular segment, but my guy Darren Hartwell sends us out. Some over-unders for the Patriots and Jaguars. You're going to hear the line, and you're going to tell me over or under. So, Total Insight. Point total for the two teams, 42.5. Mm, I'm going to take under. It's a London game. These uh, tend to skew lower, and Jacksonville's a mess. May, passing yards, 203.5. I'm going to go over. I'm going to go over again for the second week in a row. I like it. Uh, May, rushing attempts, 5.5. I'm going to go over again. I'm go over as well. Uh, Poppy Douglas, receiving yards, 45.5. I'll take this one first, also over. I'll take the over there. So we've got everything over, and the score is 42.5. Um, yeah, I think Jacksonville's going to look horrible. This is a team that the, that the coach said had a culture problem. Where does the culture come from? Are they going to go visit some museums around London? I heard there's some good ones. I've never been, though. Let's go to Piccadilly. Um, also, May touchdown passes, 0 0.5. That feels low. I bet he gets them into the end zone via the air. You? Yeah, I'm going two. Overs everywhere. That would be five touchdown passes in two games for young Drake May. Mm -hmm. uh, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the game. Patriots pregame live. Well, it's just pregame live. If we use Patriots, they'll get all inflamed to try and ban us. Pregame live starts at 8 30. 8 30. That's early. I know. So we'll see you then. Bye.